Egyptologists have argued for a long time that there is no record of the construction of the pyramids. However, there is a stone stella on Sehel Island near Aswan which was engraved on a rock. This so-called famine stella was discovered and deciphered in 1889. It tells the story of Pharaoh Djosa asking the god Knum for help during a long famine. According to Professor Joseph Davidovitz, these passages are technical instructions or some kind of recipe for casting artificial stone blocks that we call today geopolymer concrete. And this researcher has done a life experiment in France to try to recreate these gigantic stone blocks of the pyramids of Giza. In this video we are going to look at this experiment and after that we will see how these conclusions can be applied to ancient Egypt. So enjoy the video, let's go! In September of 2002 the French Geopolymer Institute team has cast massive imitation pyramid blocks or perhaps we should say genuine pyramid blocks. They used the same kind of earthen ingredients that were available to the ancient Egyptians 4500 years ago. These massive blocks had the same chemical makeup and appearance as the blocks of Giza. The limestone they used consisted of fossil shells called nummulites, like those in the Giza bedrock. Like in Giza, the French limestone was so loosely bound it did not require crushing. But unlike in Giza, it contained no kaolin clay. They heaped the cement additives lime, natron and kaolin clay near the limestone. The two components reacted in the water and built an in situ geological glue, which then yielded a hard geopolymeric re-agglomerated limestone. They began making the cement by mixing sodium carbonate found in Egyptian natron and lime in 500 liters of water. Then they added kaolin clay, which is found in the original limestone at the Giza plateau and they stirred the mix with a wooden tool. They dumped one ton of limestone rubble into the basin and mixed it with the cement. Several days later the water had evaporated from the basin, so they removed the disaggregated limestone for making the blocks. By inspecting the mixture they found that it contains 95% limestone aggregates and only 5% rock making binder material. Also they found out that it contains around 12 to 17% of water which gave it the consistency of wet sand. This batch would quickly gain strength. All of the work was done manually, forming a human chain and carrying buckets from the mixing area to the molds. They poured the limestone concrete mixture into a mold and packed it down with a tool called a rammer. Compacting the material required little effort. The packing operation encouraged cohesion and the denser mixture took on high strength from the initial curing phase. When the climate was warm and favorable, the team rapidly produced a re-agglomerated limestone that proved to be very strong, dense and replicated the size and shape of the pyramid blocks. The mold consisted of small wooden boards which could be reused many times for making other blocks. In this ideal condition the whole process ran very smoothly and was also very simple. They removed the mold four hours later. The synthetic limestone looked like natural stone with no traces of visible wood grains. Four blocks have been already made. Joseph Davidovitz presents them. The two large blocks, weighing up to four and a half tons, had the highest water content and the smoothest surfaces. The two smaller blocks, which weigh around 1.3 tons, contain less moisture and had rougher textures. When you look at the stones of the pyramid, Davidovic said, this is what you see. You see either smooth blocks or very crude blocks. 
and we were able to replicate these textures just by varying the amount of water, which depends also on the climate and on the weather. The joints between the blocks were also perfect. It would take three months for the stones to fully cure because of the climate of northern France. What do you think? What will be archaeologists' conclusions when they find these stone blocks in 4,000 years? Yeah, that's definitely a very interesting experiment. And I think this also offers many solutions to many problems in Egypt that are difficult to explain otherwise. For example, that we see these different textures um, that Professor Davidovitz has shown. Here you can see a video from the Pyramid of Unas in Saqqara, where we also see exactly that. We see different textures and different shapes and different type of stones, but they seem to be all of the exact same material. But what I find much more interesting, as you guys probably know, I'm always very interested in the underground facilities in Egypt. And there you often find things that are really hard to understand. Like for example, this site, which is called the Southern Tomb in Saqqara. The video is already on our channel, you can find it here. And there we see this gigantic shaft that apparently was cut directly into the bedrock. And further down, you can also see stone blocks and masonry work that seem to be, yeah, that has been added later on. Or maybe even earlier. Uh, we see these transitions between natural rock and stone blocks that have been worked by humans. And sometimes it really looks as if they were fused together or partly grown together with the rock. And this geopolymer story provides answers to these questions. Because when you cast these geopolymer stone blocks directly against the bedrock, as we might see here, and when they harden, then the chemical boundary between the two rocks could mix, let's say. And then it would create this effect that it's like almost melted together. And from today's perspective, it looks as if the stone and the rock were fused together. Yeah? For example, rainwater can also cause this. Over a long time, the rainwater can wash out certain components from the stone and from the bedrock, which then in turn will cause this melting or merging process. And yeah, th that could be the reason why we can observe all over the ancient world that stone blocks apparently merge with the natural rock. Modern concrete would simply disintegrate or crumble or crack over a long time. But this kind of geopolymer, it kind of gets stronger over time. Yeah, the, the, the boundary between the stone and the natural rock becomes even stronger. You can even say it is a better form of concrete than the one that we use today. Here we see the unfinished obelisk of Aswan. This is all red granite. It's uh, several thousand tons heavy. And what's also interesting, um, this geopolymer effect that we just watched can also be reversed. This means that with simple primitive means, which were theoretically available to the ancient Egyptians, you can liquefy or melt granite. I will show you a video now from Marcel Foti. You can find his profile on Twitter or x.com. I will put the link in the description. And look at this, it's crazy. Uh, he uses red granite, same as the one from Aswan. And you see the granite crumbles or it becomes like a soup. One of the hardest rocks on this planet becomes liquid. And I believe that this might be the answer to how the ancient Egyptians have solved many problems. Yeah, imagine this corridor here by the obelisk 
Yeah, imagine they put like, uh, yeah, this kind of chemicals in this trench and then they were able to kind of like almost scoop out the liquefied stone and that also explains these strange scoop marks all over this quarry and around the unfinished obelisk. Here on the left side I put another video where you can see these uh, scoop marks a bit better. And on the right side I will put a video um, there you can see me pounding the red granite with a dolerite pounding stone because the Egyptians there they placed some of these pounding stones there so the tourist can try to carve the granite and I can tell you it's a joke it's an absolute joke I think this is not possible but I think this geopolymer theory could deliver answers and also something else came to my mind maybe some of you have seen this before this is the famous melted stairs in the temple of Hathor in Dendera. And thousands of people around the world are wondering what has caused these stairs to melt. Maybe the whole thing was just an accident. Maybe there was a Egyptian carrying Marcel Foti's uh, cooking pot and he tripped and he spilled that stuff on the stairs and then the stairs simply melted away. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think about this. I will put also a link in the description to the book The Natron Theory. Super interesting stuff. Go check it out. The word Natron comes from Egypt. Yeah, it comes from Wadi Natron. It's a dried lake or a dried riverbed. And I think this, this was the first place in the world where we have extracted uh, Natron from. Interesting. Yeah, guys, I hope you enjoyed this short video about the geopolymer theory. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. If you like to support our work, you can find the PayPal link in the description. Have a wonderful day and see you in the next video. Ciao!